All right, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, bless us as we talk. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there are two related things we want to talk about today. I'm not sure if I can find a marker that will cooperate. But I want to talk to you about how the imagination works. Um, let's just see what this one does. Oh, not bad. Uh, the imagination is a tool that God put in your brain. <laughs> What does that tool do? It allows you to modify your character. It's a tool that allows you to modify yourself, your character. That has to be one of the best tools in the world. Because if you talk about things you'd like to change, wouldn't that be the main thing? Wouldn't you like to have a beautiful character? If a married couple has a beautiful character, they'll have a beautiful life. So, how does the tool work? That's important. Like a hammer was made to help you put a nail in. But there's a method to using it. You can't balance the nail. That won't work. You have to hold it. And if you hold it, you'd better have pretty good aim. Or you're going to hurt yourself. You understand what I'm saying? There's a method. So the imagination is a tool like that. How does it work? There's a key verse on this. It's 2 Corinthians 3.18. I think you know this passage. Why don't you look at it for a minute? 2 Corinthians 3.18. Hong um, Song, would you read it for us? You see that there's a metaphor in this verse? As with open face. At, beholding as in a mirror. It's saying that just like you can see yourself in a mirror. When you look at Jesus in your mind. <coughs> that his image ends up being reflected in you. The way we say this simply is that by beholding we are changed. When I dropped off um, Shumitra today uh, I was disturbed to hear in the house where I left her a television on. So I'm going to to I'll have to talk to her about that. But there was no time to do it on the way here. But I asked the lady of the house. I said, I don't like shows that have violence and anger and murder and sex and bad language. 
Anger, murder, sex, bad language, <coughs> violence. Anger. Anger, violence, murder, sex, bad language. <coughs> That's like all the shows. Isn't that all of the shows? Even the cartoons. And the cartoon, the man takes a hammer and hits another man. <coughs> or pushes someone off a cliff. I mean, it, so I, why do I care? Because of this. What does beholding do? It changes our character. So when Shumitra is here, if we all act beautifully, our character is improved. And if we act terribly, our character is degenerated. <laughs> it really puts a lot of pressure on us. But what if you are Shumitra? And you're surrounded by people who act terrible all the time. Are you doomed to have a bad character? No. No. Because this principle says that you can, with your imagination, you can look at the people in the Bible. You can think about Jesus and be changed. You can think about Abraham and be changed. This is how it's supposed to work. <clears throat> this isn't how it generally works. Why does it not generally work that way? <clears throat> because not many people spend time thinking about noble things. It's like they have the hammer. And they have nails. They just never hammer a nail. <clears throat> they pick the hammer up and they hit a window. <clears throat> they hit someone else. Uh, they might kind of throw it up and, and try to catch it. I'm trying to illustrate something. That not many people use the imagination as a tool to improve their character. And if you don't use it that way, nails aren't going to knock themselves in all by themselves. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So the Bible addresses this. So Bible Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second <laughs> Corinthians 10 and verse 4. <clears throat> it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. <laughs> but they're mighty through God. <laughs> But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. <coughs> so in old and war, like in war in old days, uh, it's easy to conquer a village without a big wall. But if there's a big wall, it really slows you down. How do you get your chariots through the wall? How do you get your uh, men over the wall? <clears throat> so there was a, a discovery made in war. <clears throat> That when people make a big wall, <coughs> if this is the inside, <coughs> they usually don't put the supports of the wall on the outside. They put them on the inside. <coughs> so 
So you can't push the wall down. Do you know what's much easier than pushing it down? It's pulling it. Because there are no supports on the outside. Did that make sense to any of you? Mm-hmm. So that's that's being illustrated in this verse. It says pulling down, how does it say it? It says, for the weapons of our warfare are mighty for pulling down strongholds. Mm. <coughs> <coughs> So yours doesn't say pulling down. No, it's only breaking it. Breaking down. Breaking down. Too bad. I'm sorry. So now look at verse five. <clears throat> casting down imaginations. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> so what are those walls that we're fighting against? It's out of control thoughts. Thoughts that just go where they shouldn't. Thoughts that think about immorality. Or think about violence. And those need to be pulled down. By the spiritual weapons. Um, so this verse is very key in counseling. <clears throat> Before adultery happens, <laughs> out of control thinking happens. <laughs> If you get control of the thinking, you'll prevent the adultery. Before cheating happens on an exam, <clears throat> out of control thinking happens. When you bring the thinking under control, you'll prevent the cheating. <clears throat> I'm sure you can even relate to what we're talking about. <clears throat> when someone decides they're just going to give up on being a Christian, <clears throat> before that happens, <clears throat> you have uncontrolled thinking. <clears throat> the imagination is just going where it shouldn't go. <clears throat> and if you can bring it under control, <clears throat> The apostasy won't happen. Now, when you look there at verse 5, are we trying to control most of the thoughts or all the thoughts? What's it say? Does it say every thought in yours? Yes. Yeah, we want consistency in this. <clears throat> because it doesn't take many thoughts to lead to a bad problem. <clears throat> so, how do you get control of your thoughts? <clears throat> what are those spiritual weapons? <clears throat> Two of them are prayer and promises. Uh, so let's look at those weapons. Second Peter 1 4. Second Peter 1 4. <clears throat> it says, Whereby are given to us, and what went, I'll just read it briefly and then you can read it in Bagla. Okay. God gave us exceeding great and precious promises. <clears throat> um, 
আর ওই গৌরবে উৎকর্ষে তিনি আমার দিগকে মহামূল্য অথচ অতি মহৎ প্রতিজ্ঞা সকল প্রদান করেছেন And so by these promises you can partake of the divine nature. Jano e e protika diye tumi pobitro shobhab nite paro. And that's how you escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. Ar ei bhabe tumi prithibite je I'll just read it. Jara tob dara tumra obhilashmulok samshar byapi khoy hoyte poran koriya ishore shorobe So look at the end of the verse. Is the world getting better or worse? It says it's becoming more corrupt. It's going through corruption. And why is it going why is it why is it becoming corrupt? That's through desires. So, that's what we talked about yesterday. Following self-indulgence. And are you doomed to follow the world in that way? No, it says you can escape. How do you escape? It says this is by having God's power in you. <clears throat> And how do you have God's power in you? That's by the promises. We need those promises. Have you ever made a habit of finding promises and claiming them and using them? <coughs> When Heidi is discouraged, when Heidi, when Heidi on when like when she's depressed, I give her some ideas that can help her get out of the darkness. Recently, she was quite down. <coughs> She heard about her mom having cancer and surgery. And one of her friends was going through trauma. And she was losing another friend. And then losing another friend. And it was too much. And she cried, cried, cried. Well, I can't fix any of those four problems. But I know some things that can help her cope. So I asked her, what are you thankful for? And she said, I can't think of anything right now. <clears throat> so I have a suggestion for you and for the people you counsel. You, you need a thank you booklet. A place where you keep the things you're thankful for. <clears throat> so when you're feeling really down, and you can't think of anything, you can look in the book. And sure enough, there's good things in your life. Because your imagination is only thinking about the negative things. <clears throat> And what will that what does that do to you? It crushes you. In a similar way, you ought to have in your booklet something about the promises. <clears throat> Because when you're having a hard time, you might not be able to convince yourself to go looking for them. So it's good to have them available. And when you have God's promise, and you say, I believe it, that's faith. And God rewards faith. And when he rewards it, you love him for that. And when he does what he says, you'll trust him for that. You will trust him. You will trust him, yeah. Mm -hmm. So using the promises is what gives you an ability to develop love and trust. So using the promises is what gives you an ability to develop love and trust. 
বিশ্বাস এবং বিশ্বস্ততা তৈরি করতে সাহায্য করতেছে What did we read earlier? এটা আমরা কি পড়ছিলাম আগে? We need weapons to pull down those thoughts and get them under control. আমাদের অস্ত্র প্রয়োজন যেন আমরা ওই চিন্তাগুলো নিচে নামে আনতে পারি এবং এগুলোকে নিয়ন্ত্রণের ভিতরে আনতে পারি। What are the two weapons we're looking at? এবং আমরা যে অস্ত্র দেখতেছি সেই অস্ত্রগুলো কি? The first one is the promises. প্রথমটা হচ্ছে প্রতিজ্ঞা। But how do we use promises? We use them in prayer. We talk about the promises in prayer. And that's how we get out of our deep darkness. Sure, there's other things you can say. But those are the key things. Any questions about this? <clears throat> so what am I saying? I'm saying that the imagination is a powerful tool. You can use it to improve your character. But generally, Satan uses it to ruin your character. How does he use it? He puts corrupt things in front of your mind. He does it with television. And with movies. And with video games. And with certain uh, music. And with certain friends. And the things they say. And all kinds of negative sources. Even Christian friends. Even those. And those Christian friends are, they might be full of darkness. And if you're thinking about the darkness, what happens? Your life becomes darker. I regret all the television I ever saw as a child. <clears throat> because it added whole levels of diseases to my imagination that had to be overcome. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Yes. If it's so serious, then why does only few people know about this? So, Raya asked, if it's so serious, why do so few people know? There's no good answer to that, Raya. All of Ellen White's books discuss this. And it's not like 2 Corinthians is only in a few Bibles. The second Peter isn't a rare book. So every Bible has it. But the truth is that very few people are interested in having a changed life. What they really want is just changed ideas. They want to change their opinions. But they don't want to do work. Yeah. I hope you understand that. So if I present this to a church, they might all say amen because this is just a change of opinions. But how many of them will go home and, and make a change? How many will get rid of the television? And stop watching the movies? And get control of their thoughts? Maybe not even one in five. Certainly not one in two. And it was the same way for Jesus. He said, when you're trying to go to paradise, don't look to see where the crowd is going. He said, broad is the way that leads to death. 
And large numbers find it. But narrow and straight is the way that leads to life. And not many find that. So what you need to do is see it, is it true? And if it's true, then follow the truth. In counseling, people want help with these problems. Counseling <coughs> because they feel dark. They know they have disturbed thoughts. <coughs> if you go to see a typical psychologist, he may ask you to think through all the terrible things that happened to you in the past. I won't say that's a terrible thing to start doing. Because it's part of the business of coping. When you wound me very much, you sin. But my reaction might not be innocent. I might hate you. But that's not innocent. I might imagine hurting you or killing you. That's not innocent. I might imagine that I'm just worthless since it happened to you. That's terrible. So, what you did is wrong. But what I did in my head might also be wrong. If I do wrong, does that excuse what you did? Not at all. But what I'm doing wrong might really hurt me. So the psychologist might ask me to go back there. And if he's a Christian psychologist, he might ask me to think through those experiences. But this time to think different thoughts. I might think mercifully about the man who hurt me. I might say, if he knew what I knew, he wouldn't have done that. If he had been raised in a good home, he probably wouldn't have done that. He was probably abused when he was young. I'm not excusing his evil. But I'm affecting my own thoughts about him. That stops me from hating him. From being bitter against him. From wanting to destroy him. And uh, so that could be helpful. But there's a danger in the psychoanalysis. I could start thinking about those terrible things. And think about them every hour and every day. Think about them for weeks and months. For months and years. And what's that going to do? That's beholding. And beholding leads to change. If you're thinking about negative things, it's going to be negative change. You got some good news, Melissa. Yes. And you shared it with Kemi. Yes. Yes, and now Kemi woke up too. Yes. Well, that's good. And now Joe Nash is away. That's all working out. There's nothing like one text message to wake up the whole class. Okay. So 
I hope you get what I'm saying. I'm saying that this business of beholding, this imagination is a wonderful tool, but Satan is usually the one who holds it. And he's usually using it to mess up your life. So God says, take the tool back. Bring your own thoughts under control. Choose what you do with them. Place them on good things. And you'll begin to see your character change. Any questions, comments, or objections? Does it sound new or does it sound like it's a review? Yes. So it's a review. But I, I hope that it's becoming part of you. This is why at, at this school we encourage you to have devotions. We want you to connect with divine power. And to spend some time thinking about good things. When I began, when I stopped watching television, so I ended three hours of terrible things. And I began, I began reading the Bible for two hours a day. I added two hours of good things. How did, what do you think that did to my mind? It was a rapid improvement. Not because I was born with such religious inclination. But because the tool works. Now, there's a bit more to the tool in 2 Peter. <clears throat> and uh, maybe we'll look at that last for the class. <clears throat> Let's start in verse uh, 5. First. 2 Peter 1 5. It's the next verse after what we read. <clears throat> Uh, and Neil, could you read that for us? So we call this Peter's ladder. Um, it's a logical development. Uh, what is it saying? You start with love and trust. That love and trust allows you to have God's power inside of you. After you have love and trust, you can have victory over your temptations. So this... These first two steps are the active part of righteousness by faith. <clears throat> so this is righteous living mm -hmm. that's built on love faith. and trust. Mm -hmm. This is righteousness by faith. So, what? <clears throat> No, no, no. You said love and trust is the faith. faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens if a man tries to live a holy life without depending on God? What if he tries to jump to the second step? <clears throat> he can't do it. Um, do you remember what we found in Daniel 12? 
where it said none of the wicked will understand. This is why so many people go wrong in theology. Um, so that going wrong in theology uh, is partly because they don't really have God's power in their life. Mm. So you don't want to try to study about what to do until you're already living well. Like, like if someone tries to study the Sabbath, and they haven't taken the first two steps, they're going to come to a false conclusion on the third step. So knowledge follows virtue. And what comes after this? It's self-control. You have some monks in this country. Buddhist monks. And there are Catholic monks. And there are Catholic monks. Catholic monks. They deny themselves. And there are vegans in this country. Uh, they deny themselves from honey and from leather. Mm. And you have some people on a keto diet. They won't let themselves have grains or fruits. Uh, those are all self-denials that are not very intelligent. Before you deny yourself, you need to have good knowledge. When Martin Luther wanted to be holy, he started with self-control. He laid all night naked on the bottom of the monastery on a cold floor. He was trying to make his body miserable. Thinking that would improve his character. You think that improved his character? Of course not. So knowledge is what allows you to control yourself in a sensible way. Control yourself to gain. To control yourself in a good way. Now the next step is interfering with what I already wrote. So I'm going to go this way. <coughs> the next step is patience. Um, Self-control and patience are related to each other. Uh, Self-control is what you do on the inside. Patience is what you do on the outside. So when you control yourself on the easy things, then you're ready to control yourself on the passionate things. So Shamitra says, Eugene Uncle, Eugene Uncle, Eugene Uncle, Eugene Uncle, Eugene Uncle. Did she do something like that to you? Maybe not to you. <laughs> no, you don't let her? No. You stop her? No. Bad girl? No. Douche too. No, we no. never say that. You never. Good. Uh, patience is how you relate, it is relating to someone who's doing irritating behavior without being irritated. Who is being irritated? That's like someone who is doing irritating things, patience allows you to not be irritated. 
তো ধৈর্য হচ্ছে যখন কেউ বিরক্তিকর ব্যবহার করে কিন্তু তুমি বিরক্ত হচ্ছ না you can't irritate jesus তুমি যিশুকে বিরক্ত করতে পারবে even if you do the same dumb thing over and over and over and over যদি তুমি একই বোকামি বারবার বারবার করো তাও না that irritation does not look christian বিরক্তি খ্রিস্টান মনে হয় না so can you start with patience তুমি ধৈর্য দিয়ে কি শুরু করতে পারো that will never work. Ministry, ministry of Healing talks about this. It, it, says it's not, it says it's not possible for a man that doesn't control his appetite to be patient. And I think if you begin watching in your life, you'll see how true that is. The people who are most indulgent with themselves are least tolerant of others. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So you have two more steps. Really three steps. But the next three steps are all about the same thing. The next step is godliness. Before you get to before you get to this step, you seem godly. Before you get this high, you seem godly to other people. When you won't do evil things, and it seems like you know about God. And you control yourself. And you won't get irritated. People will say that you are a holy man. Because they don't really understand holiness. But after you become patient, you're ready to very thoroughly develop holy behavior. The next two steps are selfless love. It starts with to our friends and family. And it moves to everyone. And that is Peter's ladder. When you begin serving people, the people you know and care about at your own expense. You give them what they need, even though it means you're deprived yourself. If one will go hungry, them or you, then you're the one that goes hungry. That's brotherly love. And when you would do that for a stranger, that's charity. So some people try to start at the very top of the ladder. It happens a lot here in Bangladesh. People go out into the poor community and pass out stuff. It's called charity work. But it doesn't have much to do with charity. Because it really isn't about denying yourself. Yeah. Any questions or comments? What happens when you follow Peter's ladder? You can claim some beautiful promises. Look at verse 8. For if these things be in you and are abounding, the effect is that you will not be barren nor unfruitful in what you know about Jesus. And uh, verse 10. Therefore, the rather brothers give diligence to make your calling and election sure. 
For if you do these things, you will never fall. For an entrance will be given to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So is Peter's ladder connected to getting to heaven? Peter says yes. He says if you're diligent with this process, heaven's gates are open wide to you. You're going to have an abundant entrance. And you're going to be fruitful here on earth. But aren't those very nice promises? They're some of the best. Based on this this ladder. The ladder starts with using the promises. Until we develop an experience of love and trust. And then climbing this business of character development. Any questions before we pray? Okay, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we're asking you to bless us in our counseling. Teach us how to talk to others. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.